Greetings everyone. PTBSI welcome you to our Asalha celebration. Allow me to start together with you. Namu Tassa Pakawatu Arahatu Sama Samputasa Namu Tassa Pakawatu Arahatu Sama Samputasa Namu Tassa Pakawatu Arahatu Sama Samputasa I bow to the Buddha. And today, allow me to pay respect also to Venerable Ananda. Ananto Putupatako Sankiti Satu Samato Pawusuto Tamataro Satasu Tinkaro Duno. Through him, we have access to the teaching of the Buddha, so we remember him today. UTBSI is almost two years old now. And I would like to pay respect to Venerable P. Sivali, the Secretary General of Mahabodhi Society of India, who is really the one behind UTBSI. My respect to UTBSI coordinators, Venerable Tataloka Mahateri from United States, Venerable Santini Mahateri from Indonesia, Venerable Dr. Liu Fap Mahateri from Vietnam, Venerable Bodhijita Terry from Sri Lanka and Australia. She is Sri Lankan, but she lives in Australia. And Venerable Sumangalo, uh, so, sorry, Sumangalo is my teacher. Sumangala from, from Malaysia. Last but not the least, Venerable Dr. Dhamma Paripuna and also uh, Venerable Vitayani from Indonesia, who are actually behind the screen and helping us to come forward to you tonight. Today we are celebrating Asalha, full moon of the eighth month. We rejoice for the completion of the triple gem, Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha. UTBSI coordinators agree to invite Venerable Ajahn Ramali, who is our first speaker. Originally, he is from the Netherlands. Very likely that he had Venerable Ajahn Brahm, Brahma Wangso, or we call him Ajahn Brahm, as his teacher and preceptor. He has been ordained more than 20 years now, so he is also Mahathera. Like Venerable Ajahn Brahm, he is very approachable, very kind to Pikunis. When we organized Vinaya training for Pikunis in Thailand, he was our main teacher. All the Thai Pikunis were grateful for his teaching. When I approached him to give a Dharma talk for our program, he was so kind to accept our invitation in spite of the fact that he was very busy. I didn't expect, you know, because people told me that uh, he is traveling from this country to that country, uh, addressing so many uh, topics to the Buddhist in different, in different part of the world. But he accepted, accepted our invitation right away. And the floor is now for Venerable Ajahn Brahmali. <clears throat> Good uh, evening everyone and uh, it is very delightful to me to be here with you on this uh, occasion of Asala Puja, one of the great holidays and one of the great religious days of the uh, Buddhist tradition. Uh, and it is especially delightful for me to be with you uh, because I've always been a very supportive of the idea of bhikkhunis and Theravada Buddhism. Uh, and I think not just Theravada, of course, but also any kind of school of Buddhism for that matter, uh, because I think the bhikkhunis make a very important contribution to the Buddhist world. Uh, and I think without the bhikkhunis, without the full uh, dual sangha, we don't really have uh, the full Buddhism that we're supposed to have in this world. So for that reason, I am really happy to be able to give this uh, short talk to you uh, and to take part in your celebration uh, uh, right there in India. 
So the uh, Asana Puja, of course, is a very significant day in Buddhism. It is the day when the Dhamma really got started, when the Buddha started his teachings, uh, and when the Sangha got established. The first monk, uh, Venerable Kondanya, Anya Kondanya, uh, was ordained by the Buddha through the famous ordination of Ehi Bhikkhu, Kam Bhikkhu. Uh, but uh, it all starts uh, really at the night of the awakening on Vesaka Puja. Uh, and uh, then the Buddha decides that he's going to teach the world. Uh, and of course, he starts wandering uh, uh, from the site of awakening at Burgaya. And he starts wandering towards uh, Saranat or Benares, where he knew that the five monks who previously supported him, uh, where they were staying. Uh, and one of the interesting little events that happens uh, during the Buddha's walk from Burgaya to Saranat uh, is when he meets the wanderer, not the wanderer, the Ajivaka Upaka. And famously, this Ajivaka Upaka, when he sees the Buddha, he says, Wow, your faculties are so clear. You look so pure and bright. Yeah, you look amazing. What happened to you? Who is your teacher? Whose teaching do you profess? And the Buddha, who was just awakened, obviously is uh, looks amazing at this particular point of view. Uh, just having reached Arahantship, uh, it makes him a very remarkable and special person. Uh, uh, but the Buddha then replies, I have no teacher. Uh, I'm self-awakened. Uh, if there is a victor in the world, I am one of those victors uh, because I have abandoned all the negative qualities, etc., etc., uh, and of course, for this uh, Ajivaka, this was just probably too much. Uh, he wasn't able to really understand what the Buddha was saying. Uh, and so he just walks off in the wrong direction, uh, uh, wagging his, uh, shaking his head and wagging his tongue. Uh, and obviously he has no idea that the Buddha is actually is in front of him. Uh, and this is a very interesting little uh, anecdote, a little interesting little story among all the rest that we find in the Vinaya Pitaka, because it shows us how difficult it is to recognize a Buddha in the world. Uh, here he is faced with a real Buddha, the real deal, yeah, someone who is just awakened and he is incapable of understanding what actually is in front of him. Uh, and he walks off in the wrong direction, uh, which basically means that he had wrong view uh, and was not able to practice the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, and I think for all of us, it's important to remember this. Uh, and uh, because sometimes you hear people say, oh, I will just wait around for the next Buddha. Uh, and when Maitreya comes into the world, then I will practice Buddhism. Uh, but this is a very, very dangerous idea because when Maitreya comes around, who knows where we will be, where we will be reborn? Uh, who knows, even if we do meet Maitreya Buddha, will we be able to recognize Maitreya Buddha? Chances are we will not, because it is very difficult to understand who is actually a Buddha in the world. Uh, and so what this means then is that we should be so happy that we still have the Buddha's teachings in the world. Uh, we should be so happy that we still have Gautama Buddha as our teacher. Uh, and we should respect Gautama Buddha by practicing his teachings fully uh, and not try to wait around for the next Buddha to come into the world. Uh, and... Uh, so this is, I think, already a very important lesson for us right there. And of course, then after the Buddha has met this Upaka, this Ajivaka disciple, he then carries on walking all the way to Benares, Varanasi. And there he comes to the five monks who helped him out before. And even these five monks, they don't really recognize that the Buddha is enlightened at this stage. They say, they make a pact between each other, we're not going to meet him, not going to support him, but then they actually do support him after all. Uh, but then they don't want to listen to the Buddha. So obviously it is difficult to recognize a Buddha. Uh, but then the Buddha eventually is able to convince them that he has something special to say. Uh, and then he is able to give the first discourse. And that, of course, is the discourse of the very famous uh, Dhamma Chakka Pavatana Sutta, the first discourse in the Pali Canon. Uh, and for that reason, a very, very important discourse. Uh, so what does the Buddha actually say in this discourse? And of course, he starts off by talking about the middle way, which is the Noble Eightfold Path, making this distinction between, on the one hand, the tormenting of the body, and on the other hand, the indulgent in sen indulgence in sensual pleasures. And the middle way being, of course, the Noble Eightfold Path. Now, this already is a very important teaching. This idea of the middle way is itself 
if you like, an aspect of right view. Uh, yeah, so this we should consider this very carefully. Uh, and that is an important teaching because uh, I think it is very common in the present world uh, that we actually veer on the side of uh, tormenting the body, the Atta Kilamatanu Yogo. Uh, it is very common in the Buddhist world. Uh, yeah, where you sit with pain for long periods of time and these kind of things. Uh, but the Buddha actually warns against, against this. Uh, he says we should find the ease of the body where we neither indulge nor do we torment the body. Uh, so please keep this in mind as you carry on your monastic life to find that balance yeah, where you don't torture yourself nor do you indulge. Uh, the balance where the body kind of disappears, the body becomes irrelevant uh, and what comes into the fore instead is the mind. It's the mind that we are cultivating in Buddhism uh, and the, bo the body just tends to get in the way. And this is really the idea of the middle way on the Buddhist path. Uh, so already right view there at the very beginning here. Yeah. And then after establishing the idea of the middle way, then the Buddha teaches the four noble truths. Yeah, And actually before he talks about the four noble truths, uh, he establishes the idea of the noble eightfold path as the middle way. Yeah. And that noble eightfold path is itself very, very interesting. Yeah. And uh, uh, there are so many aspects of it that um, stand out for comment. Uh, but one of the things I want to focus on right now is the idea that the Noble Eightfold Path starts with right view. Right view is always the foundation of the Noble Eightfold Path. And you can imagine why the Buddha would focus on right view. He has just achieved enlightenment, awakening. He has just understood the nature of reality, the nature of the human condition. And he knows that this is very different from how most people look at the world. And so it is natural for him to focus on right view, first of all, to make it clear to the world how they actually get the world wrong and how they should think about the world. So what exactly is this right view? I've already mentioned the idea of the middle way, the idea of not indulging the body nor tormenting the body. Yeah, And this is part of a larger idea of right view, which can be summarized as understanding true happiness and understanding suffering here. If you understand true happiness, if you understand where it lies, where to look for it, then of course what happens is that you start to aim for that happiness. Samma Sankappa, the second factor of the Noble Eightfold Path, which can be understood as right aim or right purpose or right intention or whatever, that comes into being because you understand happiness and suffering in the right way. So the idea of understanding happiness and suffering in the world is really the foundation of what right view is about. And it is surprising how difficult it is for the vast majority of human beings to understand this idea even of happiness and suffering. It is actually very profound. And because it is so profound, it is important that we always keep on investigating this idea, asking ourselves, what does the Buddha, Buddha mean by suffering and happiness? What should we be pursuing? What should we not be pursuing here? And as we do investigate this, we come closer to the view of the Buddha. And as we come closer to the view of the Buddha, right view is being strengthened as the very foundation of the Noble Eightfold Path. Strengthening of the right view again and again and again is such an important thing here as part of the Buddhist practice. This is what makes the whole Noble Eightfold Path work. Without that right view, the Noble Eightfold Path just doesn't work and it becomes very, very problematic. So I say, please don't underestimate the idea of right view. Please keep on investigating the suttas of the Buddha. Please keep on asking yourself, what did the Buddha really mean? Reflect on these things, contemplate them deeply. And as you do that, you will find that gradually your ideas of the world are changing. We need to recondition the mind. The conditioning of the mind is very powerful and very strong. It takes a long, long time to recondition the mind of ours. It takes a lot of effort and understanding. And contemplation of the suttas, developing our perceptions, is such an important part of this. And then, as that right view comes into place, 
we get the right aim because we understand what is worthy of pursuit. We understand what happiness is truly to be, to be found and we pursue those things instead. And then when we have the right aim, of course, the rest of the Noble Eightfold Path happens automatically. There's nothing much we have to do because the path just unfolds. We become naturally kind. We naturally think thoughts of metta and compassion for the world. We give up all the unwholesome things because we know that they are inherently problematic. And then this beautiful path of purification, it comes into existence simply by pursuing, developing, cultivating right view in this particular way. So this to me is the real Visuddhi Magga, the path of purity, yeah? is the noble eightfold path, the gradual purification of the mind, starting with sila, with virtue, uh, going on to right effort, the samma padana or samma vayama, purifying the mind, uh, going into meditation, samma sati, uh, right mindfulness, uh, and eventually culminating in samma samadhi, the right stillness of the mind, uh, which allows you to gain real access. Uh, to the understanding of the teachings of the Buddha, which then goes back and establishes right view fully and finally for you as a consequence of that. Now, one of the things that happened as the Buddha was giving this teaching, yeah, not just the teaching of the Noble Eightfold Path, but all the four noble truths, uh, is that one of the five monks, uh, he became a stream enter. Uh, and that, that, of course, was Kondanya. Uh, and one Kondanya becomes a stream enter. The Buddha says, uh, Kondanya understands. Kondanya understands. And it's as if the Buddha himself is surprised almost. Yeah, and he it's almost as if he's surprised at the power of the Dhamma that is able to actually transmit these very powerful and deep teachings to another person. We know that earlier on he had doubts about his ability to do this because the world is plunged in delusion. But now he actually sees the results of this and he goes, as if he is surprised at the power of these teachings. And then when Kondanya becomes a stream enter, then, of course, that is when the Buddha gives him the ordination. And he says, Ehe bhikkhu, come monk. And that becomes the ordination of the very first monk in the Buddha Sasana. And this is the beginning of the Sangha. And this is one of the very important things that we are celebrating on Hasala Puja, the beginning of the Dhamma and also the beginning of the Sangha. And uh, it is, of course, very interesting here that the beginning of the Sangha is not just any, other, any old person becoming a monk. Yeah? This is a stream enter. This is an Aryan. Uh, and the Buddha does not ordain anyone here before they have become noble ones, before they have become Aryans. Uh, and this includes Kondanya himself. Uh, and this shows, and it's not just Kondanya later on, the same thing happens with a large number of disciples. First they become stream mentors, then the Buddha ordains them. And this to me shows the importance in the Buddha sasana of the noble people, of the Aryas in the world. The Aryas have a very special position in the world of the Dhamma. They are the ones who are able to carry on these teachings, bring it on from generation to generation, from country to country, from culture to culture, because they are the ones who understand what is truly going on. So I would uh, recommend you, I would uh, urge you to please remember the importance of actually realizing these teachings in your own life. Uh, because it is when you understand these teachings for yourself that they become incredibly powerful. That is when you become a real blessing for the world. That is when the Sangha becomes truly special and is able to keep these teach teachings going for future generations as well. Uh, so please take these teachings very, very seriously. Please strive to achieve these things in the right way and thereby become true blessings for the world. And that is my wish for all of you. And once again, I wish you a wonderful Asalha Puja. And I hope you all find the inspiration in the monastic life to take you all the way, as I've been suggesting here. And that is all for now. Thank you very much. It is really wonderful to hear Venerable 
Brahmali's teaching, you know, this is our practice. The fact that we had some trouble in between. The first one we couldn't hear at all, but all of us were so patiently sitting here, not disturbing uh, the organizers behind the screen, you know. The two of them, one is working in Thailand, the other one is working in Indonesia. So they are working uh, very hard to get both Venerable Brahmali and his voice to us, you know. So I'm most grateful that uh, he actually pointed out that we are already in this Buddha's time. Why is that some of our uh, Thai people, you know, they would be waiting for the future Buddha? Do we know whether we are going to be born in his time? Suppose if we were born in the Buddha, future Buddha's time, maybe we were born, we will be born as a dog. So we wouldn't be able to, to practice, you know. So that's a very good point. And whenever also uh, uh, mentioned about right view, in order for us to continue this Sangha, we have to have the right view. And he insisted on the fact that we need to investigate, need to investigate the Buddha's teaching, put the Buddha's teaching really into practice. And that's how uh, the Arya Sangha will continue on the Sangha into the future. That uh, is one wonderful, wonderful blessing from Venerable Brahmali. I would like to thank him deeply. And now I would like to introduce you to the second speaker. Uh, our next speaker is one of our most senior uh, Pikunis, Venerable Tathaloga Mahatheri from the United States. Venerable was interested in Buddhism at a very young age. He was first trained as a monastic in Korean tradition. Uh, I thought Venerable, Venerable uh, Dhamma Paripuna, you can put on the her her bio bio data. I, I am just addressing my technician, you know, so that we can see together. Yes, the other one. Yeah, and and slowly move move uh, the the page. Yes, and whenever was first or uh, trained in Korean tradition and in 1997 that she was fully ordained in, in Theravada lineage. So she is one of the very most senior uh, Pikunis in our time. Please uh, look at her bio data. Maybe we can, uh, whenever Dhamma Paripuna can move to the next page. Thank you. You keep moving like that, you know. Allow people to read for a while and then you keep moving. She is also UTBSI coordinator. We met, we have this uh, UTBSI, you know, where our meeting, the time zone is Asian time zone because many, most of us are from Asia. So whenever the Thaloka has to sacrifice to be with us for, for the meetings. One time it was it was well after 2 a.m. Can you imagine? And he, she was still with us. We in Asia, you know, our time zone is daytime, but it was something like 2 a.m. So eventually we requested her to please go to bed, you know. So she sacrificed a lot to be with us with the UTBSI. Uh, please move the next page. Yes, you can read. Uh, her, her work and her her commitment to the to the Buddhist path, and uh, she is very keen to establish the Pikuni Sangha in United States. Go to the next page. Thank you. I think yes. Now uh, the floor is uh, below. The floor goes to Venerable Tathagata. Namo Buddhaya, Namo Ratanataya. Greetings from California, from our Dhammadrini Bhikkhunis Aranyabodhi Awakening Forest Hermitage, to all most venerable Mahateros and Mahateris, to the venerable Sangha Bhikkhus and Bhikkhunis, noble monastics and householders, Dhamma friends, 
I'll be speaking on living a fully intentional and dedicated life and the meaning of asalha. Intentionality and dedication play such an enormous role in the meaning of the asalha punami, <clears throat> ex exemplified by the bodhisattva and the buddha. The intentional choice to take birth in this world as exemplified by the asalha full moon descent into the womb at the conception of the bodhisattva. Intentional choice in dedicated, committed relationships based on commitment to shared dedication as exemplified in the bodhisattva's asalha marriage to his dedicated dhamma partner of many lives. Intentionally setting forth as a seeker on the final quest, as exemplified in the Bodhisattva's Asalha, great renunciation, Abhinekama or Abhinishkramana. And finally, on the Asalha full moon, setting the Dhamma wheel in motion as an awakened one and the foundation of the Sankha. Here we must speak of the Buddha's intention, even from lives past, to have a fourfold community. For the foundations of the Sangha, it's important to know that we're speaking of Sangha as of two kinds. First, as the four pairs and eight kinds of noble beings, that is the Arya Sangha. Of these, on the Asalha full moon, there were only two people who opened the Dhamma eye, male and female, the ascetic Anya Kundanya and Kali of Kuraragarika, a lay woman pregnant in her final term of pregnancy. Second, we're speaking of the monastic Sangha. At this time on the Asalha full moon, still the Bhikkhu Sangha only not yet the dual sankha that the Buddha intended. What it means to be inspired by and uphold that intention 2,567 years since the Buddha's Parinibbana or ultimate Nirvana. As I'm known as something of a historian or her historian, or I'd like to say our historian, 2,567 years since the Buddha's Parinibbana means 2,647 years since the Buddha's descent into the womb, that is his conception that we're commemorating today, 2,618 years since the Bodhisattva's great going forth, Abhinekamana, which we're commemorating today, 2,612 years since the Buddha set the Dhamma wheel into motion, per classical Theravada counting, which we're commemorating, and also 2,607 years since the founding of the Bhikkhuni Sangha, the establishment of the fourfold community of the Buddha, and the fulfillment of the Buddha's intention to have a Buddha Chattu Parisa, when Mahapajapati Gautami Terry, in no long time, one week later, attained to arahathood. Our organizer and moderator, Venerable Bhikkhuni Dhammananta Mahateri, asked me to share something about the formation of the Sangha uh, in modern times in the U.S., also recent ordinations. So in this talk, I'll be speaking not only about the initial or original formation of the Sangha on the Asalha full moon in the Buddha's time, but also about the Sangha's formation over time and space, and even contemporarily, the Sangha's progressive and successive reconstitution or restitution and reformation. We can look at the three trainings or tisika in Pali, or Pratraisika in Thai, as a yardstick that the Buddha himself used with regards to the Sangha's formation and endurance. The Tisika, or three trainings, are factors of the rightness as well as the long endurance of the Sangha. 
We can see in our contemporary times now what a revival and spread there has been. First, a Buddhist meditation, particularly mindfulness, and also the Vipassana and insight meditation movements, as well as the popularization of jhana samadhi teachings and practice. In the Tisika, or three trainings, this is the training in samadhi, or in adhicitta, that is, higher mind. We can also see contemporarily the enormous and widespread revival of teaching the suttas from the early Buddhist canon Suttapitaka, and they are being made widely accessible to the public in a wide variety of languages. And we even increasingly see spread of the study and teachings of the Pali language itself. This is the Panya Sika, or training in higher wisdom, Adipanya. Last, but not at all least, as it is so foundational, we've seen a mass spread in the international popularity of undertaking Sila Sika with people of all walks of life from around the world undertaking traditional Buddhist precepts for periods of retreat, for the Ubosatas, and for temporary or longer term monastic ordination which is traditionally based in Patimoka Sila. It's here, with the Sila Sika, that I would like to note the contribution of the revival of the Bhikkhuni Sangha. As Sila Sika for the monastic Sangha is defined as Patimoka Sila. Patimoka is the discipline of the Bhikkhus and Bhikkhunis. With the revival of the Theravada Bhikkhuni Sangha, we're seeing a revival of training and dedication to the practice of classical Buddhist sila, that is Adi sila, training in higher ethics and higher morality. And this revival of training in classical Buddhist ethics is happening during the same period as the revival of the training in samadhi, classical Buddhist meditation, and the revival of the training in Panya, that is the training in classical Buddhist wisdom of the early Buddhist teachings. Surely this is not a coincidence. Did you know that it was in Sarnath where the Buddha set the Dhamma wheel in motion on the Asalha full moon that the Bhikkhuni Sangha was revived? And it was 25 years ago this year, in 1998, that the first Theravada Bhikkhuni preceptors were appointed and the first Theravada dual Sankha Bhikkhuni ordinations revived once again on the island of Sri Lanka. It was 10 years later in 2009 that the dual Theravada Bhikkhuni ordinations spread out of Sri Lanka and began again in India and spread into Australia. I was a part of that as was Ajahn Pramali on this program. And 2010 in North America, here at Aranya Bodhi, Awakening Forest Hermitage. In 2015, in both Europe, in Germany, and in Indonesia, as well as in Thailand. And in 2022, in the U.S. state of Virginia, and in the country of Bangladesh, both long awaited. In 2022, the United Theravada Bhikkhuni Sangha International, UTBSI, our host, was founded and offered its first next generation international bhikkhuni ordinations in Bodhgaya. And it should be noted that just over one year ago, also in 2022, the Himalayan Mula Sarvastivada Bhikshuni ordination lineage was revived in the Himalayan Buddhist kingdom of Bhutan. All three ancient Buddhist Savakayana or Shravakayana Vinaya lineages now once again have fourfold Sankhas as the Buddha intended. This is the first year in a very long time that all three of the three great remaining early Vinaya schools, the Theravada school of South and Southeast Asia, the Dharmaguptaka school of East Asia, and the Mula Sarvastivada school of the Himalayas have all had living fourfold communities, including bhikkhunis, as the Buddha intended once again. It's as if we're moving into a new era. 
in 2023, new bhikkhuni preceptors for the next generation have been appointed in Thailand and also in Europe, in Germany. The international Cambodian Theravada bhikkhuni sangha has been revived just one full moon ago. To return to the Buddha's criteria of the health of the Tisika amongst the fourfold sangha as a yardstick for the health of the sangha and its long endurance, I'd like to note that while truly impressive and monumental, this revival of the training in classical Buddhist sila has not yet come as far as the revival and popularization of classical Buddhist meditation practice and classical Buddhist wisdom studies and teachings. This is not because sila is less important. The revival of classical Buddhist sila might even be considered in some ways as far more important and significant. Why? This is due to the foundational nature of right sila in the Noble Eightfold Path, which expands on these three trainings which the Buddha notably expounded on this Asalha full moon in his seminal Tamachaka Pavatana teaching, Turning the Dhamma Wheel. The training in right Samma Sila that's in tune is a basis and support for the right Samma Samadhi, the meditation that is in tune, which is in turn a basis for the clear seeing and insight that leads to noble vision and breakthrough to the noble truths, the opening of the Dhamma Eye, and that noble wisdom which then illuminates and literally rocks the whole great trichiliacosm with that right wisdom that is in tune and is characteristic of not only an arahant samma sambuddha but also of arahant savaka and savika buddhas that is the fully awakened noble disciples of the buddha who themselves open the dhamma eye Indeed, when the Buddha set the Dhamma wheel into motion in the Deer Park in Isipatana, in the Garden of Seers 2,612 years ago, per classical Theravada Buddhist counting, it was the opening of the Dhamma eye amongst his listeners and news of this, which was the cause of the great quaking and light spreading through this great trigeliacosm reported in the Sutta. Among all the Buddha's miracles, the Buddha himself said that it is this miracle of the teaching of the Dhamma, that is, the successful teaching of this effective Dhamma, with both path and fruits, that's the greatest miracle of all. Of course, many will know that the reason we so laud the success of the first turning of the Dhamma wheel is that an even greater success was very soon to follow, one week later, on what we call the Anatalakana Atami, with the Buddha's teaching of the Anatalakana Sutta, the discourse on non-self, that the Arahant Sankha reappeared in the world. This is the great significance. This is the fruition of the turning of the Dhamma wheel. And so it is that in all the tellings of the foundation of the Buddha's Bhikkhuni Sangha as well, this point is clearly made. That is, with the going forth in full ordination, Upasampada, for women too, replete in Patimoka Sila, full arahanthood, full awakening is possible. And likewise, as within seven days after the initiation of the Bhikkhu Sangha and the Asala Punna Mi Full Moon, the fully awakened Arahat Bhikkhu Sangha appeared in the world, which we now and in this coming week celebrate. So it was too that within seven days after the initiation of the Bhikkhuni Sangha on the September Full Moon, the Padapad Punna Mi, that the Arahati Bhikkhuni Sangha likewise appeared. We'll be celebrating this two lunar months from now. This time was in fact the real time of the c 
complete fulfillment of the Buddha's intention and vow. With these great contemporary revivals in Sila, Samadhi, and Panyasika, we'll see that the revival, the restitution of the Buddha's meaning and vow is complete when we have not only Kasaya-robed Bhikkhu Sangha and Arahat Bhikkhus and Kasaya-robed Bhikkhuni Sangha, but also Arahat Bhikkhunis once again. Together with white-robed male and female householders and renunciate disciples of the Buddha, all with noble realizations, all attaining ultimate Nibbana, as the Blessed One so clearly intended and affirmed before he set foot so faithfully towards the deer park and there turned the Dhamma wheel on this Asalha Punami full moon. Dedication. May these great teachings and the significance of this great opportunity that we now enjoy not be lost on us, but may we do our level best, arising with wholehearted intention and dedication, setting forth with wholehearted intention, dedication, and effort, practicing with all of our mindfulness and strength, and experiencing the fruits, and then doing whatever we can to ourselves turn that wheel forward that never turns back, passing beyond all suffering and distress, and paying it forward as the Blessed One, the Buddha, our teacher himself did. Tanyata, sadhu, 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 anumodami. Thank you very much for your patient listening. Maybe the host can can fix the screen properly. Menro Dhamma Paripuna and Vijayani, could you please fix the screen? Yes, I continue. You know, it's very important. The point that Venerable Tata Loga made that now, uh, uh, I just give you a little information. In Ashoka's time, that is 300 years uh, BE, Buddhist era, he mentioned about 18 schools of Buddhism. But these 18 schools now, only three exist. That is Theravada. Now Theravada, we have revived the Pikuni ordination since 1998. Then Dharma Gupta. Dharma Gupta Vinaya is practiced by Mahayana Buddhists. They have continued the lineage from Sri Lanka to China way back in 433. And the Pikuni ordination continued since, you know, so they never died out. And now the, la the, the third one, which is the latest one, is the Mula Sarvas Divada. Mula Sarvas Divada is practiced by Tibetan Buddhism. Now, only last year in June, yes, in June, they have given ordination to women. If I remember remembered correctly, 140 of them. So we can say that the three existing schools of Buddhism all have the Pikuni, all have Pikuni Sangha. That is a great joy for us. The next speaker that I would like to introduce is Venerable Santini Mahateri from Indonesia. Venerable Santini was ordained, was fully ordained in the year 2000. And uh, I think you, you can see the screen now. Thank you. Profile of Venerable Bikuni Santini Mahateri. Venerable Bikuni Santini Mahateri is the chief of the Indonesian Theravada Bikuni Sangha. She was ordained as Anagarika on 29th of September 1990 by the late Venerable Bhikkhu Giri Rakito Mahadeva. After waiting for a long time, then she found the way to be ordained as Theravada Bhikkhuni by the Venerable Dr. Hanapola Gunaratana Mahadeva on 15th of April, year 2000. She has founded a monastery on 1993, namely Vihara Kusalayani. Then now the monastery has three branches. First, Etia Sangamita Kabonjero, Jakarta. Second, Vihara Sangamita Karawang. Third, Vihara Arya Dwipa Arama, Tamamini, Indonesia, Indah, Jakarta. 
in the revival and development of the international Theravada Bhikkhuni. She was participating as an Upajayani or Pavatini five times in Australia and once in Indonesia, as a Kama Vachacharini once in Thailand, and as a Vignesh once in Sri Lanka and once in India. On June 21st, 2015, the Indonesian Theravada Bhikkhuni Upasampada was held for the first time, spectacularly after more than a thousand years of absence. On that occasion, nine candidates came from various countries. She travelled to various cities in Indonesia and to several other countries to spread the Dhamma. In the year of 2007, the United Nations awarded her the Outstanding Woman in Buddhism Awards. In the year 2020, she was also selected as a recipient of an award from the Pancasila Ideology Development Agency from the Indonesian government. This appreciation was for those who have achievements and innovations that are beneficial to society, nation and state, as well as the international community. In this case, she received an award for the category of Interfaith Mover. Her other activities, hosting Dhamma retreats for children and adults twice a year, hosting meditation retreats three times a year in Vihara Kusalayani, once a year in Brahma Vihara Arama Bali, printing Buddhist magazines for adults and children, organizing social activities in several towns, recording Dhamma talks to send through social media, giving online Dhamma talks during COVID pandemic, and daily practice. Sad, sad, sad. So Mangala, you know, for introducing Venerable Sa Sa Santini for us. Yes, now we would like to have Venerable Santini on on the floor, please. of all, I would like to pay respect to Bhante Pisiwali Mahatero and all my seniors Sangha Bimba. My dear Dhamma sisters and brothers, ladies and gentlemen, again we celebrate Asaha Puja this year 2023. Amazingly, we are still alive so we can once again contemplate what happened thousands of years ago. I imagine Prince Siddhartha attained enlightenment and life revealed its secret about the way to the cessation of suffering. I imagine the Buddha for the first time preached the teaching he called Dhamma. I imagine the five ascetics who are so lucky to hear the teaching for the first time. Kondanya, Badia, Wapa, Mahanama, and Asaji. I imagine the situation in Diapa, Isipatan, where the Sangha was established for the first time. Thus, Tiratana, the Triple James, Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha were complete. Really amazing. The Buddha's first sermon was called Dhamma Chaka Pavatana Sutta, the turning of Dhamma. It was cherished with abundant joy and happiness in all the realms up to Brahma realms. The bright lights of Dhamma shone radiantly chasing away darkness. Until this time, in this very life we are living, the teaching of the Buddha still exists. And we super lucky to still have the opportunity and the charge to learn Dharma and still better to practice Dharma in our daily life. Yet, I ask myself, as you should ask yourself too, have I practiced hard enough? 
if I make the best use of this life to go the furthest possible way in order to come to the cessation of Dukkha? Have I progressed enough in the path shown by the Buddha, our great teacher? We all know that our great teacher, the Buddha, has taught us to liberate ourselves from suffering and to attain true happiness. But instead, many of us do the opposite, trying hard to attain suffering and trying hard to get rid of true happiness loss. Let us check our life. How do we spend our day? Everybody has the same length of time, 24 hours a day, not more, not less. Now, how do we spend this limited edition called time? Do we spend every day in grief, sorrow, lamentation, pain, disappointment, sadness, despair, depression, etc. Or we spend the day free from them. Do we spend every day increasing and compiling greed or loba, aversion or dosa, delusion or moha? Or we spend the day trying hard to erase them. My dear Dhamma sisters and brothers, ladies and gentlemen, the other day I was reading Anguttara Nikaya 62 about Dinodata. In that sutta, the Buddha said that Dinodata was bound to go to hell for a year. He really not So scary. Of course, I do not want to experience that battle, but what to do in order to escape from that fate? I need to work super hard to follow the advice of the Buddha. And luckily, the Buddha has given us the clear explanation about the way to escape that unhappy destination. We can find this again in Anguttara Nikaya 62. The Buddha used an extraordinary analogy to make us disgusted with bad qualities. Suppose there was a sewer deeper than a man's height, full to the brim with pieces, and someone was sunk into it over his head. Then along comes a kind man who wants to help make this unfortunate person safe. He wants to lift the unfortunate person out of that sewer which was full of feces. But circling all around the sewer, he couldn't see even a fraction of a hair stick of that person that was not smeared with feces. So nothing could be done to help this person or us. Conclusion that person was going to a place of loss to hell. They had to remind for an ear in reading about. Later, our great teacher explains about three types of person pertaining to qualities and future origination of them. To which type do I or you belong? Let us check. Type 1. Both skillful and unskillful qualities are found in this person. The skillful qualities of this person have vanished, but 
the unskillful qualities are still present. Nevertheless, their skillful root is unbroken and from it the skillful will appear. So this person is not liable to decline in the future. Type 2. Both skillful and unskillful qualities are found in this person. The unskillful qualities of this person have vanished, but the skillful qualities are still present. Nevertheless, their unskillful root is unbroken, and from them the unskillful will appear. So, this person is still liable to decline in the future. Type 3 Both skillful and unskillful qualities are found in this person. This person has not even a fraction of a hair's tip of goodness. This person has exclusively dark, unskillful qualities. When his body breaks up after death, he will be reborn in a place of loss, a bad place, the underworld hell. Furthermore, on Bhante Ananda's question, the Buddha explained the three counterparts. Counterpart 1, both skillful and unskillful qualities are found in this person. The skillful qualities of this person have vanished, but the unskillful qualities are still present. Nevertheless, their skillful root is unbroken, but it's about to be totally destroyed. So, this person is still liable to decline in the future. Counterpart 2 both skillful and unskillful qualities are found in this person. The unskillful qualities of this person have vanished, but the skillful qualities are still present. Nevertheless, their unskillful root is unbroken, but it's about to be totally destroyed. So, this person is not liable to decline in the future. Counterpart 3, both skillful and unskillful qualities are found in this person. This person has not even a fraction of a hair stick of unskillful qualities. He has exclusively bright, blameless qualities. He will become extinguished in this very life. Again, I ask myself, as we all should do, where am I in those six groups? First three, type one, not liable to decline. Type two, liable to decline. Type three, bound for a place of lost help. Second three, counterpart one, liable to decline. Counterpart two, not liable to decline. Counterpart three, born to become extinguished. My dear Dhamma sisters and brothers, ladies and gentlemen, nothing is gratis in this life. Everything has a price. Conclusion. Let us use this Asalha Puja to exert ourselves to move forward step by step, doing the best possible. Maybe the goal is still far, but every step we take means one step closer to the goal, Nibbana. Reached through the first stage, Sotapanna, the stage 
realities that we are not liable to decline. Happy as our future. May all beings, especially us all, be spirited to erase the unskillful qualities. May all beings, especially us all, be spirited to grow the skillful qualities. May all beings, especially us all, put an end to suffering for good. Thank you. Thank you so much, Venerable Santini. It is very clear presentation. We can actually hear her and we also see the script, you know. For those of us whose uh, English is not very good, uh, we don't miss even a word. So this is a very good presentation and we come to the end of uh, celebrating Asalaha today. Thanks to all our speakers, the three speakers, one from Australia, one from United States, one from Indonesia. All of them really made today a great day for us. And yes, we will keep practicing. We will look at the Buddha's teaching and put it in our life. Thank you so much, particularly for those who participate. The number we have here is the highest one was 86. Right now, there are 85 of us together. Let us enjoy Asalha. Let us put the teaching of the Buddha into our life and keep practicing until we meet again next time. Thank you. Bawa tu samba manggalang rakan tu samba dewata samba bunda nu bawena sada soti bawan tu te bawa tu samba manggalang rakan tu samba dewata samba dharma nu bawena Sada sotia bawan pute bawa tu samba mangala rakan tu samba dewata samba sanghanu bawe na sada soti bawan pute Sadu, 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 sadu. Thank you. Udo, shunti, shunti, da. Udo, gavi, da.